Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin O'Brien, the director of the Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley, and I'm happy to welcome you to a wide-ranging panel on Xinjiang with a special focus on Uyghur voices and experiences. Over the next two hours, we'll be hearing about a variety of topics, including Uyghur music, sexual violence in the camps, the re-education labor regime in the Northwest, and the conceptually and politically fraught issue of cultural genocide. We have a lot to get to, so after reminding audience members to keep their questions for the panel members short and to avoid long statements in the question and answer box, now let me first turn now to some brief introductions. Uh, our first speaker will be Sean Roberts. Sean is an Associate Professor of International Affairs and the Director of the International Development Studies Program at George Washington University's Elliott School. By trade, uh, Sean's an anthropologist who studied the Uyghurs for 30 years, writing his dissertation on the Uyghurs of the China Kazakhstan borderlands, uh, while a PhD candidate at USC. He's published widely on the Uyghurs, and he's the author of the recently published book, The War on the Uyghurs China's Internal Campaign Against a Muslim Minority. Our second speaker will be Darren Bailey. Uh, Darren is an incoming assistant professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver and a postdoctoral fellow in the China Made Project at University of Colorado Boulder. He's the author of a forthcoming ethnography titled Terror Capitalism, Uyghur Dispossession and Masculinity in a Chinese City, and our narrative-driven book called In the Camps, China's High-Tech Penal Colony. His current research focuses on, on infrastructure development in global China. Elise Anderson is based in Washington, D.C., where she works as a senior program officer for research and advocacy at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. She earned PhD degrees in Central Eurasian Studies and Ethnomusicology from Indiana University in 2019. Her research focuses on the relationship between Uyghur music and politics. In 2019, she served as a Liu Xiaobo Fellow at the Congressional Executive Commission on China. She regularly gives commentary on the Uyghur crises to the press, and in 2020, gave expert testimony to the Subcommittee on International Human Rights in Canada's House of Commons. Rachel Harris, our fourth speaker, is a professor of ethnomusicology at SOAS at the University of London. Her research focuses on religious and expressive culture among the Uyghurs, and her latest book is called Soundscapes of Uyghur Islam, was published in 2020. Uh, she had an edited volume come out in January 2001 called Ethnographies of Islam in China. She's currently working on sustainable development projects on re revitalizing Uyghur culture heritage in Kazakhstan. Okay, so let's turn now to our first speaker who will be talking for about 15 or 20 minutes, uh, Sean Roberts, about cultural genocide in the name of counterterrorism. Thank you. Um, so as, as was mentioned, the topic of my, my talk is, counter, uh, is cultural genocide in the name of counterterrorism. And I refer to what's happening to Uyghurs and other indigenous peoples in China right now, uh, in particular in the, the Uyghur homeland of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region as cultural genocide, not to engage the contentious uh, debate about whether this should be considered genocide by international conventions or international law, but rather to elucidate uh, the reasons why this is happening. It's very similar um, to other attempts by settler colonists to uh, sever the ties of native peoples to their land, break their solidarity and destroy their identity prior to developing and settling said land. And you know the examples of North America and Australasia come to mind. In fact, if you look at some of the tactics being employed by the Chinese state in this region, they're very, uh, there's a lot of similarities uh, across these different examples. Uh, in, in this sense, it's more about uh, territory uh, and the territory that Uyghurs see as their homeland and the Chinese government sees as Xinjiang than it is about the people who live there. Um, however, I think it's important to note that colonialism also always has material bases and uh, more idealist justification. So obviously colonialism is always motivated by usurping land, exploiting natural resources, exploiting people and so on. But most colonialism also has idealist justifications that serve to convince both the people involved in colonialism 
and others that the actions they're undertaking are benevolent. So in the 19th and early 20th century, European colonialism, um, we saw that the justification was often the civilizing mission, civilizing savages, often including christening of pagans and so on, which fit very much with the European ideals of modernization where modernization essentially equaled Europeanization. The idealist basis of the Uyghur cultural genocide, I would argue, is more about countering extremism and terrorism through de-radicalization. But I think there's uh, some very clear similarities. So we have kind of the discourse of savages transformed into a discourse of extremists and terrorists, and the idea of civilizing uh, transformed into de-radicalization. So how did the savages of 19th and early 20th century colonialism turn into the terrorists of the 21st century colonialism, at least in this case. Uh, I think to, to understand that you have to look at both global and uh, global processes and local processes within China. So uh, globally, obviously, after September 11th, the label of terrorists took on new meaning. The US led global war on terror, portrayed terrorists as evil, uh, and danger incarnate and, and use that justification to essentially suspend their human rights, anybody labeled as a terrorist. Also, since terrorists are considered non-state actors, it was assumed that waging a war against them does not require adhering to the internationally accepted rules of combat between states. Um, but I think a, a key point here is that there is no internationally accepted definition of terrorism or terrorists which essentially has given states a free hand to decide who they view as fitting this category uh, and including domestic political opponents, particularly if they're Muslim. And as terrorism became linked to Islam inherently through the global war on terror, uh, this quickly became a vehicle to racially profile entire Muslim populations, especially in non-Muslim majority countries. <coughs> And I would argue that's what we see happening in China right now. In terms of more local processes, I think it's important to understand what, uh, what preceded the global war on terror in this region. Um, throughout the 1990s, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the PRC became increasingly obsessed with the threat of ethnic self-determination. And that was particularly true in Tibet and the, in, in the Uyghur homeland where um, that issue was much more salient. And simultaneously, Uyghurs became more interested in the possibilities of self-determination as they looked at new nation states emerging across the border in former Soviet Central Asia. Um, as a result, we saw the Chinese state uh, launching numerous strike hard campaigns in the region that targeted Uyghurs suspected of disloyalty to the state or harboring self-determination aspirations. In addition to targeting intellectuals assumed to be nationalists, these campaigns also went after Uyghurs expressing rel religiosity publicly. Um, and as this created a standoff between Uyghurs and the state, uh, there were isolated incidents throughout the 1990s of violence in the region. And, and these, these instances of violence during the 1990s were essentially played down by uh, the state um, which wanted to suggest that the discontent in the region was limited. Uh, the 2000s uh, marked a shift in that discourse of separatists as a label for Uyghur disloyalty to terrorists. So shortly after 9-11, the PRC issued actually several um, policy documents, white papers and different uh, documents that claimed it faced a serious terrorist threat from Uyghurs and that this terrorist threat was directly linked to Osama bin Laden. Um, these, these documents name a litany of Uyghur diaspora organizations in Europe, Central Asia, and Turkey as being part of this, uh, a, a big terrorist network that it calls the Eastern Turkestan Terrorist Forces. And um, these documents include a list of 200 violent instances that took place in the Uyghur region during the 1990s, claiming that they are all perpetrated by this amorphous terrorist network. Um, now, 
initially, the, the international community did not really pay much attention to these claims. Uh, a lot of countries were familiar with some of the organizations on, on the list uh, of groups that were accused of being part of this terrorist network and knew that it was very unlikely that they had links to uh, Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. But this suddenly changes in the summer of 2002 when the US State Department recognizes one uh, previously unknown group in, in the Chinese documents, the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement or ETIM as a terrorist organization linked with Al Qaeda and helps China also to get a similar recognition of the group as a terrorist organization at the UN. And importantly, the State Department, uh, uh, when it announces this, it actually goes beyond the accusations of the Chinese government. And it, it links this uh, previously unknown group to all 200 uh, violent incidents, um, many of which you know, uh, could not really uh, qualify as terrorist acts um, that happened during the 1990s. Um, when, when the Chinese government actually linked those to a, a, a number of different Uyghur diaspora groups. So uh, some of my research over the last few years has been focused on trying to understand what was this group ETIM. Um, and one of the things I found is no group ever called itself the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, but the group that became associated with this label and, and the designation of being a terrorist group was a group that existed in Afghanistan and Pakistan between 1998 and 2003, and was essentially the vision of this person, Hassan Masum, who was a Uyghur from a rural area who uh, left the state, uh, left China in 1998. And he did um, eventually end up in Afghanistan with the goal of trying to establish a religiously inspired war of independence in its homeland. Um, but uh, he had no support from Al Qaeda. And in fact, there's some evidence that the Taliban held the group in check at China's behest. It was very poorly resourced. Uh, it was a very small group. Uh, and there's no evidence that it ever carried out any violence anywhere, let alone uh, the 200 acts that the Chinese government and the US State Department linked to it. Um, the organization essentially ends with the death of the leader at the hands of the Pakistan military in 2003. And it's important to know that a year before he's killed, he, he calls into Radio Free Asia and condemns the 9-11 attacks and asserts that he has no ties with Al Qaeda. Um, now it's interesting, uh, this at the time was a, a, a pretty significant event and a lot of, uh, a lot of us who were studying the region and Uyghurs at the time were, were concerned about it. But uh, in many ways, between 2002 and 2009, um, this has limited impact on the situation in the country. Uh, for one thing, uh, the Chinese government does not report hardly any violent incidents in the region uh, during this time. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, arguably a more aggressive um, turn in the policies that it had used in the 1990s against the local population, but it's very similar. Um, and the big difference is the change in discourse from separatists to, ter to terrorists. Um, at the same time, you, you start to see in the early 2000s an increase in mass development in the region. Um, and, and this mass development also includes a lot of incentives for Uyghurs to assimilate into Chinese culture through educational and job programs. Um, it also ends up displacing some Uyghurs. Uh, it ends up with some destruction of important uh, sites to Uyghurs, such as uh, the Kashgar Old City. Um, but you, you don't really hear actually much discussion about terrorism from the side of the state. Um, the objectives in the region are mostly focused on development. And the other thing that happens from that development is a, a significant influx of Han migrants to the region. Now, I would argue the situation changes substantially with the, we, with the Urumqi ethnic riots in 2009. Um, arguably in 2008, the Beijing Olympics were also important because there was a, a different Uyghur group from abroad that had made videos threatening um, the Olympics. Uh, but that just increased kind of the discussion of this alleged Uyghur terrorist threat. 
Um, I think the what happened in Urumqi in the summer of 2009 changed uh, the situation significantly. Um, so uh, I won't go into all the details, but you know there were several Uyghur workers who were killed in a factory in southern China after rumors spread that um, a Han woman had been raped at the, at the factory by Uyghurs. Um, and a Uyghur protest was held in Urumqi, which is the capital city of the Uyghur region, uh, mostly led by university students and um, calling for justice in terms of um, these killings. Uh, from what we can tell, security violently cracks down on the protests and street violence breaks out, which eventually degrades into ethnic violence for about three days, including both Uyghur on Han and Han on Uyghur violence. But most importantly, this has nothing to do with terrorism, extremism, uh, religion, uh, or, or anything um, that uh, could be associated with this idea um, of the global war on terror. Rather, this is a spontaneous and passionate explosion that I see being much more uh, emerging from tensions of development and migration, uh, and also, of course, perpetrated by a uh, state crackdown on a peaceful protest. Um, but the, the state essentially blames Uyghurs for the violence, even though there have been violence on both sides. Uh, and it especially targets rural Uyghur migrants from the south of the region, which is a region that is mostly uh, Uyghur demographically uh, and has, has been um, underdeveloped compared to the rest of the region. Um, and it also focuses on religious Uyghurs as being at fault for this. Uh, so subsequently, there's a, an intense crackdown in the south of the Uyghur region, and particularly in rural areas, and Uyghurs feel um, they're under immense pressure from state security. Uh, the, the state um, starts employing all kinds of violent uh, ways to weed out alleged terrorists uh, responsible for these riots. And um, that leads to some violent resistance from Uyghurs, um, in which the state, of course, characterizes as terrorism. And this begins kind of a cycle of escalating violent repression, resistance, repression between law enforcement and Uyghur civilians, particularly in rural areas. Um, and I, th I feel that that's when things start falling apart in the region. Between 2010 and 2014, you, you still have the mass development happening, especially in the South. Um, and at the same time, you, you have the, the Uyghur uh, rural population in the South, uh, in particular, and some of the urban population feeling under intense pressure, thousands leave the region using human trafficking networks through Southeast Asia. Um, violence gets worse and worse between law enforcement and rural Uyghurs. Um, and of course, every time that happens again, the state uh, suggests that this is terrorism. And uh, this group that had threatened the Olympics, the Turkestan Islamic Party, which I found is also at this time of very little consequence and has no real reach into the region, it continues to make videos cheering on any local violence that happens and um, calling, that, uh, calling them acts of jihad, which of course only provides the state with more uh, justification for violence against Uyghurs in the name of counterterrorism. And by 2013-14, uh, there's several violent instances that take place that look more like terrorist attacks, corresponding, of course, with Xi Jinping's rise to party secretary. And, um, you know, th these acts of violence, I have, I found no evidence that there's any links to international networks. Um, but, um, of course, the Chinese state continues to try to make that link. And uh, as a result, in 2014, the government initiates a people's war on terror that particularly targets rural and religious communities, um, but generally limits public expressions of relig religiosity across the board. Um, at this time, they essentially put in regulations that criminalize aspects of Islamic practice outside state-sponsored religious institutions, and um, they establish kind of a, a laundry list of markers of how you can uh, identify an extremist. Um, and while this is mostly felt during this time among rural and religious Uyghurs, um, I, I believe that this is really setting up 
um, most of the infrastructure that gets put into place after 2017. So we see the beginning of a mass electronic surveillance system in, it, with, with also a large database that can be um, brought down to the individual uh, on each Uyghur uh, about their behavior, um, their religiosity, their loyalty to the state and so on. And we also start seeing beta testing of re-education methods. Um, and I, I see this all of a sign of uh, what is to come. And uh, that comes in about 2017 is a network of policies are put into action um, that I feel are essentially trying to, trying to commit cultural genocide, to sever Uyghurs from their land, break their, their solidarity, uh, destroy their culture and language, um, and transform the region itself. Uh, so even though that really starts in 2017, I think its origins are it, more in 2014. And the first sign of the shift where it goes from targeting, uh, you know, a limited idea of the dangerous Uyghurs to um, all Uyghurs, and not only Uyghurs, but other ethnic groups in the region, um, happens in, in 2017 with the initiation of a two-faced official campaign that punishes Uyghur party officials for tacitly supporting terrorism and extremism, or at least for not opposing them enough. And after that, um, the rest is kind of, um, I think many people already know, we, we started to see people disappear into mass internment camps and prisons, and the situation has only subsequently gotten worse. So in conclusion, I, I believe that the actual motivations for what the PRC is doing to Uyghurs and other indigenous peoples in the region is really about development and settlement of the Uyghur homeland, particularly its southern reaches, which have traditionally had little Chinese influence and have uh, been demographically overwhelmingly Uyghur. Um, however, I also think that the global war on terror helped accelerate the state's tactics for doing this especially as it related to how to deal with the region's indigenous peoples. Because we see since the beginning of, of the global war on terror, the, there's been kind of a, tr a, a gradual escalation of the targeting, going first from targeting Uyghur nationalists, um, and that's you know, even in the 1990s, assumed to be a minority as an obstacle to this development and settlement that the state wants to undertake that becomes reframed after 2001 uh, as terrorists and extremists. Um, it starts moving to targeting Islam as the root of extremism, and it ends up racially profiling the Uyghur and related people's entire collective identity as an obstacle to state plans. Um, and just as a final word, I wanna say that, you know, it is important to think about this in terms of um, if the motivations uh, for cultural genocide um, are really about the state plans for this region. That does not mean that um, that is the conscious goal of all of those implementing state policies. You know, many during the age of European colonialism had convinced themselves that they were exploiting other lands and population uh, populations for those populations' own good. Um, essentially internalizing colonialism's alleged civilizing mission. Today, I, I think many PRC state officials likely similarly believe they are saving Uyghurs from extremism and terrorism. Um, thus, in this case, at least, the savages of the 19th and early 20th centuries um, in, in colonial context have become the terrorists and the extremists of the 21st century both terms allowing for the exclu exclusion of entire populations as being obstacles to progress. And also in both cases, the aims are the same and are fundamentally colonial. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sean, for that uh, excellent and concise summary of the political history of the situation in Xinjiang. I think it will help our listeners, uh, some of whom aren't familiar with things that happened before uh, the re-education camps were set up, uh, to get all on the same page as we move into our other presentations. Now we'll move on to Darren Beiler, who will be talking about labor issues in Xinjiang. Oh, I did the, I had myself muted. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is 
infrastructure power and the re-education labor regime, really picking up on what Sean has laid out for us, uh, but mostly starting around mid 2018, which is when the state began to talk about uh, factory spaces that were being built in industrial parks, um, often nearby the camps, sometimes within the camp enclosure. Um, the, we could see these being built on, on through satellite imagery. This is a camp that's close to Korla. Um, here is the formal camp enclosure. Um, and these are the factory type spaces that are adjacent to it and dormitories in between. And to zoom in a little bit at another camp, uh, this is one uh, that's close to Khotan. Um, and here you see the formal prison space of the camp um, with these sort of pen-like structures next to the camp enclosure, uh, which is where people do outdoor exercise. Um, and then right behind it here is the factories. Um, this factory space, there's actually uh, about a dozen of these buildings, um, is described in by the, you know, China Daily and other newspapers as um, a new capital of the, the shoe capital of the Silk Road. Um, they're gonna make this a, a hub for shoe manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> this is what it looks like inside those shoe factories um, that are adjacent to the camp. Um, and these are the managers of uh, some of those shoe factories. Um, in this case, the, the factories were paired with um, a, a city in Eastern China in Fujian province. Um, so a lot of the, the development initiatives are, are done through pairing assistance programs where it's a sort of sister city or sister province relationship that's set up with a locality in Xinjiang. Um, and these uh, are billed as Xinjiang aid projects or uh, poverty alleviation programs. Um, and the, the factory owners are incentivized to relocate their factories or parts of their factories to Xinjiang um, in order to kind of stay in the good graces of local officials back in their home province. Um, but also through financial incentives. Um, oftentimes the factories are given to them rent-free for up to 10 years. Um, and then there's other subsidies you know, for each worker that they re-educate through the factory process. Um, they're given you know, something like 5,000 yuan per worker. It varies slightly from region to region, um, but this is just to sort of give you a general sense. So what I'm focusing on here is, is how how these systems are, are put in place, how they are managed, and what effect they have on the on the populations that are put to work in them. Um, so as you move from the camp enclosure to the factory space, you go through a checkpoint. Um, and there's often multiple checkpoints even within um, the factory enclosures as well. Um, this is a, a factory a, a checkpoint that's in a room to you, which is not at that hotel space, but just to sort of lay it out for you, where you have you know. You have a, a metal detector. You also have a, a face scan machine here where you would have your ID matched uh, to your face. Uh, it's looking at the image that's on your ID and then matching it to your face to assure that it's you. And then the CETC data door here, which is the China Electronics Technology Company, the parent company of Hikvision, which is the world's largest camera manufacturer. These, these data doors collect information from the person's smartphone to assure that the person whose ID was just checked is the same person that's carrying the smartphone. It's also a way of geolocating the person in space. So why are they moving factories to this space? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, one of them has to do with uh, cotton being one of the central crops that's grown in Xinjiang. 84% of Chinese cotton comes from Xinjiang. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense that they would locate production of garments in the same space that the cotton is grown. Um, the state wants to move around 1 million textile jobs to Xinjiang by 2023. That would mean that around one in 11 uh, textile or garment manufacturing jobs uh, would be in the Xinjiang region. Um, some of the drivers behind this are the rising cost of labor in Eastern China. Uh, so already jobs are leaving places like Shenzhen and going to places like Bangladesh or Vietnam. Um, now there's a sort of domestic space where they can do offshoring of labor as well, where there's a, a population of people that can be put to work at very low wages um, and without any sort of um, potential for resistance. And then there's all these subsidies that are put in place as well to help incentivize it. So by mid 2018, the, the Xinjiang Development Ministry talked about the camps as becoming a carrier of the, of the economy. 
uh, Zaiti. Um, here they were comparing the camps and the human resources of these laborers to the equivalent to, to at the same level as oil and natural gas um, and cotton, the, the, the drivers of the economy um, that had been in place you know, since the 1990s. Um, and they said that it's becoming a carrier because it's attracting so many companies from Eastern China to relocate to Xinjiang. Um, this system is, is framed as poverty alleviation, um, which is, um, so, so on the face of it, it, it appears to be a job creation program, something that's really gonna benefit Uyghurs and Kazakhs and others that are, are pushed into these jobs. But as Jennifer Pan, um, who's a, a, a political scientist at, um, at Stanford has shown in a recent book, there's often a kind of institutional seepage that moves between sort of uh, civil ministry projects and state security, uh, where, you know, it, a, a program that's about development becomes more a program about controlling populations, about um, you know, making sure that problematic populations don't push back against local government, that everything kind of stays harmonious. And this, I think, is really a limit case of, of that sort of framing of, of the way that, you know, something that's framed as development becomes something about control. Um, at the colonial frontier in places like Tibet and Xinjiang, the, this kind of development is, is often offered as a sort of gift. That's what Emily Ye has shown in her work in Tibet. Um, and Andrew Fisher has shown that that gift actually produces a kind of disempowered development where you know, the local population that's targeted by the gift is actually not, in, is, is not put in position, positions of power in the system. Um, and so they in, instead begin to kind of lose control of their own sort of destinies and they're opened up to new forms of dependence and exploitation. So in the Xinjiang case, I've, I've interviewed around 15 former detainees at this point as part of a book project I'm working on. And five of them were put in formal forms of, of, uh, of work in factories. One of them is this woman, her name is Gulzira Al Khan. Um, she's now in Kazakhstan. She was released uh, because her husband put a lot of pressure on the Kazakhstani government and they in turn pressured the Chinese government to have her released and she had a green card so she was allowed to come back. Um, she had returned to China in 2018 to care for her elderly mother um, and she was detained almost immediately. She was found guilty of watching Turkish TV shows where people wore hijabs, of traveling to Kazakhstan, of having a passport, of being under the age of 55, which are all you know, taken together signs of, of untrustworthiness. So she spent about a year in a camp. Um, this is in Gulja, which is in Northern Xinjiang. And then was released uh, for about three days uh, back to her village after she had passed some language and, and political ideology exams. Um, then the local authorities came and said, now you've been assigned to work in a factory. And it turned out that this factory was actually adjacent around seven kilometers from the camp where she had been held the previous year. Uh, she was assigned to work in a glove factory. And this is her boss. His name is Wang Xinghua. Um, here he's speaking in a, a state TV interview uh, with a sort of local TV uh, news network. And he's saying that the, the factory he set up, this glove factory, has created around 2,000 jobs for Kazakhs and Uyghurs. So it's a really successful job creation program. Um, and it's generated $6 million in sales in 2018. Um, so it's really actually quite lucrative as well. Um, what he's not saying in, in the interview is that he was paying Gulzira and the other workers around uh, 300 yuan, which is around a sixth of a minimum wage. Um, and on, then on top of that, a sort of piecemeal rate of one and a half pennies per pair of gloves that they made. Um, so there's a, a really kind of, there's a form of really super exploitation that, that's put in place here. Um, Gozira recognized Wang Xinghua because he had actually come to the camp and had, had come through and sort of inspected the detainees and he had selected her to be one of the workers because she had a, a background as a seamstress. Um, and that's important to note because it's showing that there's a direct connection between the factories and the camps, um, that the factory owners are very well aware of, of the workers that they're employing, what, what kind of conditions they're coming from. In some cases, it, other 
former detainees told me that in their factory spaces, they were actually locked in kinds of cubicles. Um, and their understanding from the guards and the managers was that they were being treated as criminals and as dangerous. Um, in Gozira's case, they weren't locked in, the, in those ways, um, but there was other forms of control. Um, the first kind of form of control was she was told if she didn't continue to work, if she didn't sign this low wage contract, that she would be sent back to the camp. Um, that's, the, that's the most obvious form of coercion that's in place here is that camps are, are you know, what the alternative is to, to working in these factories. Uh, Gozira told me that there were checkpoints at the entrance of the Waldorf dormitory and factory where her ID and face were scanned. She said, we would have our bodies and phones checked when we arrived and in the middle of the day. When we were leaving for the dormitory at the end of the day, they would check again because they were worried we might take a sewing needle. After we got to know the police contractors, we asked them, why are you still here watching us? They just laughed and never replied. The answer to this question was that security workers were monitoring whether or not they were acting like submissive, re-educated industrial workers. And this is what she told me. Um, uh, another former re-education worker named Erbeke told me, we just had to smile and say, yes, yes, we were like pets. So what Erbeket and Gozira are kind of conveying is that this is a system of unfreedom, a system where they really don't have a choice but to work in this space, um, and that it's a, a sort of nested system of digital enclosure. So even if they're able to leave the factory compound, um, they're going through a checkpoint, and then there's always going to be another checkpoint. Um, and so there's really no way of escaping the system. And they're also, they know that their behavior is being tracked um, and, and, and checked on daily. So what are the implications of all of this? Um, well, the way that I've been thinking about it recently is, is in relation to the infrastructures themselves, um, these uh, digital enclosure systems, the, the fencing and all of that, um, and, and really thinking about how it produces new forms of control over bodies and movement. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm thinking with a, a framing of this that's called infrastructure power, that's coming from a, a sociologist named Michael Mann. Um, and what he's thinking there is that it, it's really about increasing the circulation of the good while decreasing the circulation of the bad, which is pretty similar to you know, Foucault's framing of biopower. Um, it, it begins to shape patterns of movement while increasing social control and dependency on the state. And part of what is, is done through this is, is the surveillance aspects of this because there's so much contact between the state and, and the individuals um, as they move through checkpoints and other, and other spaces, um, the, the, the state has a, a lot more knowledge about what the workers are doing and they can increase in efficiency and increase control. So it's like extending power of the owning or colonial class by making workers efficient and predictable in intimate ways. Uh, this is, is then used, I argue, to produce a kind of re-education labor regime. Um, so here I'm really thinking with work from Pudnai, who's working in Eastern China in places like Shenzhen, where, where she's talked about a dormitory labor regime that's actually endemic throughout factory work in Eastern China, where migrant workers are put to work in spaces that are the same spaces that they live in. So the dormitories are in the same location as the factory, which means that the factory owners have a lot of control over how long workers work, when they work, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, that is happening here as well. The dormitories are at the same space as the factory, but then there's something on top of that, with, which is all these digital forms of control. And so I've been thinking in addition to that with the work of, of Michael Burroway and others who are, who are looking at the way labor was set up in apartheid South Africa, um, how compound labor regimes were normalized producing forms of segregation that really focused around mining. Um, it, in that case though, there was less of an impulse to transform the population. Part of what's happening in, in these spaces in Xinjiang is the Uyghurs and Kazakhs are being trained to speak in Chinese. They're being trained um, to uh, embrace sort of Chinese cultural values. And so it's, there's an assimilation aspect to it, but at the same time, because they're marked as different, that assimilation is always blocked. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to questions. I'd like to thank Darren for his uh, fascinating talk on labor in Xinjiang. And it reminds me of an earlier era in China studies, even the 1970s, when we were relying on indirect methods and also refugee interviews uh, in a way that we often have not relied on uh, nearly as much for the last 40 years or so. Uh, 
for re various reasons, uh, this may be coming back uh, throughout China studies. Now we'll turn uh, to Elise Anderson, uh, who somewhat far afield from the kind of work those of us who work on politics and economics will be talking to us about Uyghur soundscapes. All right, I believe I have my screen going. So um, thank you all for being here today with us. Thanks also to the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's a real honor to be speaking uh, alongside all my co-panelists as well as to all of you out there in the ethers. So yes, um, shifting gears a little bit to, to something um, quite different from what Sean and Darren have just told you about. Um, I think you'll see some and hear maybe some echoes of some of the things they've been talking about, but I wanna to talk to you about um, uh, soundscapes and sound more broadly and how looking at forms of sound and silence as they are, are sort of being manipulated, erased and replaced in the Uyghur region can give us um, some insight into the, the scope and the scale um, of what is happening. So I titled this talk, Compelled Silence, Compelled Sound, Erasure and Replacement in Uyghur Soundscapes. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this, I published a, a short essay in the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs last December, the slightly different title, uh, Compelled Silence and Compelled Sound in the Uyghur Genocide. Um, you can take a look at that if you would like. And this is also forthcoming as a longer book chapter, um, a more appropriately academic style article, so to say. So what I'm arguing or what I'm, the ideas I'm trying to develop through this work. Um, so they, they build from this essential idea that the Chinese state assault on Uyghurs, as well as on Kazakhs and other indigenous peoples in the Uyghur region includes um, some really important sonic components that it is easy to overlook sometimes when we're thinking sort of top level about what's happening. So when I look at the sound environment that I'm quite familiar with as an ethnomusicologist who studied this region for a really long time, I can see that the state is compelling forms of silence and sound in its assimilative policies and its assimilative practices, right? That it's actually putting in place in the region. And so these, these ideas that I'm sort of tweaking and proposing of compelled silence and compelled sound are, as I've already said, showing the scope of state intrusion into some of the most intimate aspects of Uyghur life. I'm specifically speaking about Uyghurs um, as that is the, the background of what um, what my research has focused on and so forth, the language I speak. Um, but this is very, uh, you can say very similar things for what's happening in the Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Kyrgyz, and, and so forth in the region as well. Um, and a final note. So some of you, if you're familiar with literature, uh, there's literature in sound studies and ethnomusicology that talks about the concept of enforced sound and enforced silence. And you might be wondering, why I'm not saying enforced sound or enforced silence. Um, and that's because I, I get from the word compelled um, a couple of different readings, a couple of different meanings I think are very useful. So if we're talking about enforcement, we are talking about you know, a very clear sense that there's some sort of actor acting on you know, another person to cause them to do things, right? That, that's a, a pretty clear statement that we see someone acting on another person. When I think about compelled, however, I find it more appropriate for these practices I'm talking about because compelled, at least in the contemporary sort of colloquial usage of that word in American English right now, it can have both transitive and intransitive meanings. So the transitive meanings of it, right? The directly more causative meanings would suggest that you know, sometimes someone can compel a person to do a certain thing. We see examples of that in what I'm going to be talking to you about. At the same time, um, we also use compelled in intransitive senses. So it can have reflexive and passive meanings as well. I was compelled to do something. I felt compelled, right? Um, I think of that as a, yeah, a fundamentally reflexive. Um, sort of use of that word. And so I think that helps me to get at articulating a way that um, 
there are certain, right, these assimilative policies I've been talking about have helped to engender and sustain uh, a, a sort of a context and an environment of fear in which you see individual Uyghurs and others self-policing, right? Kind of compelling themselves to act in certain ways, to make sound in certain ways, or to be silent in certain sorts of settings, right? This is fundamentally a form of self-censorship. And so I think that the notion of compelled silence and compelled sound, as I see them um, working out here, right, are a, a little more appropriate at conveying those two important sides of this horrible coin. So um, there are two different places where I see compelled silence and sound playing out that I would like to talk to you about today. And the first of those is in the camps. Um, so I wanna look at some statements from survivor testimonies uh, and really hone in on some of the things that they have to say about times when they were able to um, you know, make sound and make silence. And this is, this is building off this idea you already heard Sean talk about, which is that um, you know, one of the goals right, of, of this project really appears to be to break Uyghur's sense of community life, right? their sense of connection to the place that they live, their life ways and so forth. And that's reflected very well in this statement, um, which was by a Kashgar official and, and translated and quoted by Ben Dooley in the AFP back in 2018. Right. One of the goals of this whole campaign is to, to break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections and break their origins. So um, Gülbahar Jalilva, an ethnic Uyghur from Kazakhstan, uh, who spent, if memory is serving me correctly, somewhere around 18 months being shuttled between three different camps in Urumqi. She said in an interview in Uyghur on Istiklal TV that uh, talking was not possible. There were cameras everywhere and they would punish us if they saw us talking to each other. When they punished us, they had these dark rooms that they would take us to. No one could even lie down in those dark rooms. They were one meter by one meter. And she goes on more at length about this, but you know, the important thing to draw out here, right, is that there were times in periods of enforced silence, right? The complete you know, disallowal <laughs> Of, of speech in these camp settings. Um, we see that elsewhere, right, in carceral settings throughout the world. Uh, this is not unique to this particular setting, but it um, starts to speak to, you know, a thing that other sound scholars have talked about, which are the way, ways that uh, sound environments can be manipulated and are, right? <laughs> State and other actors will manipulate sound environments as forms of torture and forms of control. Um, and it is not only Gul Bahar Jalilaba who has pointed that out. Um, Kalbinur Siddiq was uh, conscripted against her will into teaching in two different Urumqi camps, a period of nine months total in 2018. And in an interview to Radio Free Asia in October 2020, she recounted um, at length, right, what those experiences were like, but some of her commentary similarly had to do with you know, sound, sounding and, and speech and so forth. So she recounts walking into her classroom for the first time and saying, I said, assalamu alaikum to them. And they all sat there quietly and said nothing. I realized I'd said something wrong. So well, let's get started, I said, and began teaching. And then she goes on. Once class started, students didn't have permission to ask questions and they were absolutely not allowed to speak in Uyghur. All the books and materials we used had to stay in the classroom and it wasn't possible for us to bring phones inside, right? So communication cut off, um, the right to speak freely cut off. You know, the very fact that the teacher said, assalamu alaikum, a, you know, religiously inflected, but uh, overall pretty benign uh, greeting, right? Was met with complete silence. Um, this these kinds of things, you know, were stark enough, right, that they stick out in her memory as important to mention in um, an interview like this, right? And they speak to, again, that, that control and manipulation happening in the sound environment. Um, but I see these as forms of erasure 
fundamentally. Um, and you know, things that are when things are erased and taken away, there are often things that they are replaced with, right? And we can see some very clear examples of that inside the camps. So another survivor, Mehrbil Torsun, um, said in her testimony before the Congressional Executive Commission on China in November 2018 that, quote, before we ate breakfast, which was water with very little rice, we had to sing songs hailing the Communist Chinese Party and repeat these lines in Chinese. Long live Xi Jinping and leniency for those who repent and punishment for those who resist. We had seven days to memorize the rules of the concentration camp and 14 days to memorize all the lines in a book that hails the communist ideology. Those women whose voices were weak or cannot sing songs in Chinese or remember the specific rules of the camp were denied food or beaten up, right? So we can see you know, physical, physical torture, physical punishment, right? As a means of um, punishing people right, who can't comply with with these forms of compelled sound right so it's not just enough that the state in these internment settings or representatives of the state have taken away the right to make sound freely as as one might you know hope to but they've also replaced them with compulsory compelled sound making through chanting through singing right these um you know forms of sound making that are, are very physical, very embodied, right? And I think, as I already started to say, when we're focusing very top level um, at what's happening, you know, looking at the scale of, of all of these different components um, of the, the genocidal campaign, uh, it's easy to overlook elements like this or to think that maybe they're not sick, that significant, but I, I do think they are quite significant because they, they can help to show us, right, just exactly how far this goes and just exactly how much of an assault, right, this has been on individual people. Um, for other forms of replacement, right, or other forms of compelled sound, this is an image from what I believe, if memory is serving me correctly, was a BBC visit to one camp, which of course China is portrayed as being, you know, a vocational education center, vocational training center, um, where um, detainees whom they call students were tasked with, you know, singing and dancing. I mean, there have even been absurd exam examples where students were kind of paraded out to uh, sing, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, which of course has um, really disturbing echoes with things that happened on the Southern border in the United States in 2019 as well. Um, Right, but more compelling people to make certain sounds in certain ways, sing songs in Chinese, sing songs in English, etc. Right, silence is a vacuum that can be filled with something, and in the camps, it is being filled with explicitly patriotic, pro China, pro CCP songs, chants, and so forth. Um, the compelled silence and compelled sound has been playing out beyond those camps as well. And this is another thing I think it's really easy to forget when we're thinking so top level, keep saying that, uh, about what's happening about this campaign, right? Because it, rightly so, I think the camps have gotten the most attention in the international press. And, you know, that's the thing that sticks at the forefront of, of people's minds when they think about Uyghurs and, and what's happening in the region today. Um, but this campaign is multi-pronged, right? It also includes forced labor and family separation and on and on and on. And even Uyghurs who are not in some form of state detention are still fundamentally living in forms of unfreedom, right? To pick up on that concept that, that Darren um, introduced. And, and that includes, you know, Uyghurs who, to you and, and myself, it might look like our, our living free lives on the outside, uh, the surveillance system, um, the human surveillance and technological surveillance makes it such that, you know, they are all living in this state of unfreedom, essentially. So um, two of my distinguished colleagues, co-panelists here have um, written some, some great work that considers 
um, some of the dimensions of what has happened to Uyghur music since this campaign began in earnest in 2017. Um, Darren Byler and Amy Anderson wrote about the uh, performance of Hanness and kind of replacement of some parts of Uyghur traditional music with Han cultural expression. Um, that's an article from 2019. And then chapter six of Rachel's book, Soundscapes of Uyghur Islam, um, considers you know, this role of what she calls sonic territorialization through song and dance as ways of you know, expressing um, state power through sound. So you might find those, um, as I have, instructive and helpful in right, further getting into what's happening in Uyghur music. Um, ensembles, these are performers from the professional Mukam ensemble. That's essentially Uyghur classical music based out of Urumqi, um, with an even, I think even greater frequency than before in some cases have been you know, dispatched to rural parts of the South to perform explicitly, um, again, patriotic and pro CCP shows. Um, things like this happened before 2017. I mean, to pick up on Sean's point about how, you know, <laughs> Um, in the, these years immediately preceding 2017, um, sort of the seeds were being sown for what we're seeing now. Many of these, you know, technologies, forms of control, et cetera, were being put into place. And of course, you know, music had been drawn into political projects like that for a long time as well. But we've seen you know, further acceleration of this since. Um, but I, I want to show you, I'm getting to a few musical examples now, um, and I want to show you a few examples from Uyghur pop music, which I think has long been a really excellent gauge for political attitudes. Now, that's not to say that Uyghur music is always just explicitly political. That's not the, the idea that I want anyone from, to walk away um, with from this talk today. But um, if you're interested in this, one perhaps accessible essay um, is one that I wrote and published in the LA Review of Books last May called The Politics of Pop. And among many other points, I make this point there. Uyghur music is, has long been a gauge for political attitudes. And that's partly because it has long included um, sort of allegory and codes whereby Uyghurs, Uyghur performers, can speak to Uyghur audiences in ways that are a little bit subversive, sometimes even more than a little bit subversive, but while still passing the censors as well, right? And so Uyghurs, even though they lacked a civil society for decades, they were not allowed anything approximating what we would think of as a civil society-like space, performance, music, dance, and so forth, um, was in many ways a civil society-like space where, you know, Uyghurs could kind of talk to one another about these ideas in coded ways, right? So that makes some developments I've seen in Uyghur pop music over the last few years especially interesting. So um, I decided last minute that I didn't want to show you people's faces <laughs> I didn't want to show you people's pictures, so I put these kind of crude shapes over them, forgive me. But um, you see here a music producer and a performer. He's got a banjo in his hands. He's uh, very talented and plays a number of instruments. In 2017, very early on in you know, the detention of intellectuals and as the mass internment campaign was taking off, this particular performer put out a song in Uyghur called Xi Jinping Khmer Shlangan Kui, or a song for Xi Jinping. Um, and this marks a really dramatic departure in style from his own um, sort of musical output, but also of course in topic, because I don't know. Um, you know, many of you are likely unfamiliar with Uyghur music. Uyghurs have not ever tended to sing about, you know, Chinese political leaders and, and not to, you know, um, dedicate songs to the general secretary of the party of the, you know, of the CCP now. So I'll let you listen to just a little bit of this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
toprak mağriba, yıldızlı han meşrimiz. Çaknap yen en ruhidi, yankunlı han kalbiniz. Felak perver danade, söyersiz ni halkimiz. Parasettin, paklektin, dillarga nur septin. All right, so um, I'll go ahead and, and stop there so you don't have to, you know, listen to minutes and minutes of this, but, um, you know, it's it, this particular song starts out in some ways with, you know, the, the lute that's played at the beginning, um, sounding like Uyghur music, you would listen to this and think, okay, you know, this, this sounds like Uyghur music, um, and, but once the singer who is known in particularly well for his stylings with the ornamentation um, required of Uyghur classical music, which he has long you know, incorporated into his pop stylings. Um, the song is not completely devoid of those sensibilities, but there, there is something about it that is distinctly different and jarring for, I've talked to a number of Uyghurs, right? About how they think about this song and so forth. and. Um, there's something jarring about the kind of aesthetic qualities of it. And then the lyrics take that, you know, completely over the top, right? This, this very explicit praise for Xi Jinping, which again is, is not something that um, we would have seen, you know, on stage or in recorded music over the past several decades and it's it's such a stark departure and it was a sign early on that something was very wrong and i can't sit here in front of you and tell you you know that someone forced this singer to write that song and that someone forced the singer to sing that song and perform it um, but i think you know what i'm trying to get at and this, this point of the second meaning the kind of more intransitive meanings and uses of, of the concept of compelled right are relevant here because this, this performer is living in such an environment um, of, of fear, of control, and of unfreedom that, you know, I think it's safe to say he likely felt compelled, whether anyone was standing over him forcing him to write this or perform this uh, is maybe of no matter. Because to me, this looks like a performance of loyalty, right? And something similar to what we have heard about and read about happening in the Cultural Revolution era. Um, quickly, uh, I will wrap up with a, a second example. So that was from 2017. Um, this example, again, with a very, a very crude box <laughs> over the video, I decided last minute to kind of hide this. Um, excuse me, having some tech problems here. So in 2020, uh, another beloved Uyghur musician uh, did a live stream concert. It was one of the first concerts he had done in years, which people got really excited about, Uyghurs all over the world. Um, and then many were shocked to find that this concert included a, a very explicitly patriotic song in Chinese with some English called Wo Ai Ni Zhongguo. <laughs> Shanghai all right so it continues much um like that um the the lyrics for those of you, you know, who can't understand them are likening 
the relationship between the singer and China to that of mother and child, right? And, and what is so stark about this, in addition to the musical aesthetics, ornament, the complete lack of ornamentation, the complete lack of elements that, that would make you go, oh, this is Uyghur music, right? That's one issue. Putting that aside, since this is not a technical music talk, um, what's really stark here is, is just the very title of this and the lyrics of this, I love you, China. So Uyghur musicians, such as this musician <laughs> himself, you know, have long sung in, in coded ways about what they'll call the homeland. And, you know, I already talked about Uyghurs using code, using allegory and so forth to kind of make it through the censors, right? And, and talk about sensitive topics on stage through their music with their audiences. Um, so Uyghurs did this for decades. They would sing about the homeland. Um, it would make it through the censors because any Uyghur performer could ostensibly say, oh, when I say the homeland, I'm talking about China. But what Uyghur audiences knew was that when a Uyghur singer such as this one or you know, any other was singing about the homeland on stage, they were singing about the Uyghur homeland, right? Not China. But even that is too dangerous to say now. And so we have this very explicit um, you know, statement of patriotism here. It's not, I love you homeland. There's no ambiguity, right? That ambiguity, the space for um, the code has, has been sort of collapsed, is gone and is replaced with something else here. And again, you know, I can't say someone was standing, we can't say that someone was standing over this singer forcing him to sing in this way but at the very least, right, this environment of unfreedom, of fear, of censorship, right, is leading Uyghur performers to self-censor in ways um, that we haven't seen for decades. Um, so I have another example I think I will skip over. Uh, for the sake of time, um, thank you for your attention today. I look forward to questions that you might have and apologies for my uh, <laughs> technical issues. I always say it's not a presentation until someone has a technical problem. So I am happy to have been um, that person to make this you know, a real event today, but um, thank you for your attention. Okay, I'd like to thank Elise for reminding political scientists like me that when we use words like power and coercion, or protest scholars also like me, when we use words like silence and voice, that we use them in a rather impoverished way, and that there's a lot to be learned from ethnomusicologists about terms that we consider to be very much in our wheelhouse. Uh, now we'll turn to Rachel Harris to talk about women's voices in Xinjiang. Hi there, and um, thank you very much um, to the organizers for um, Putting this panel together. It's been really fantastic to hear everybody. Right, so my, my talk in some ways um, overlaps with Elise, but I think um, takes us in quite different directions in the end, so please um, bear with me. Um, I should also um, give a warning that some of this may be triggering for some people. Uh, I don't intend to share any graphic details here, but I will be talking broadly about violence against women in the Xinjiang camps uh, and why I think we should be listening to the voices of Uyghur women and other Muslim minority women from the region who have spoken out about what they've experienced. Um, but first, perhaps um, I should say a word on why I think that I have the right to, to speak out on this difficult topic. Um, I personally have been working in this region for, for more than 25 years. Uh, I've traveled extensively. Uh, I live for long periods in cities and in rural areas. And for the past 10 years, I've been working on a project on Uyghur religious life. And as part of that project, I spent a lot of time working with village women. So um, primarily recording their life stories and also taking part in daily life in the village sweeping the yard, eating watermelon, learning how to make noodles, uh, and also participating in um, ritual religious life. 
so Elise has already very kindly shared um, uh, an image of the book. Um, the, this, this book really began life uh, one afternoon in 2009, um, shortly after the riots that Sean told you about. Um, at that time, I was in a small village uh, and I sat in a room with about 60 other women uh, and they were conducting a big ritual to mark the festival of Barat. And they recited Zikr, uh, which is um, a set of rhythmic Arabic language prayers. And they sang Hikmet, um, Uyghur language prayers, and they danced uh, um, a dance that they call Sama. And they, they cried, they wept a lot. Um, I would just like to play a little bit of that for you so you can hear what it sounded like. So quite different sounds from those of the uh, propaganda songs we've just been hearing. Uh, I wonder how you hear that kind of sound um, as a disembodied recording, uh, but still drenched in emotion, which I, I expect will come through even via Zoom. It is a, an effective experience to, to hear that. So, so for myself, sitting in that room, um, it was really a, a very affecting experience. And I spent 10 years really trying to understand what it was all about. What were those women trying to say? What were they trying to do? Um, and also how that practice related to the big issues in the region's politics. That was religious revival and increasingly state violence. So the women I worked with, these rural Uyghur women are really the most marginalized in the whole of Chinese society, I would say. They have a triple disadvantage, uh, their minority status, their gender, and uh, the fact that they live in the rural areas. So they're um, commonly regarded as backward uh, in the Chinese law hope, um, uncivilized, superstitious. And certainly, uh, I think it's um, no leap to say that the state, the Chinese state, uh, would hear that recording that I just played for you as a kind of feudal superstition, and more recently, of course, as a kind of religious extremism and indeed terrorism. But the women themselves um, spoke to me about what they were doing, what it all meant, and they talked about it in terms of something they called ishq. Ishq is um, love or passion, right? Um, they, they explained that that reciting and that weeping did two kinds of work. Uh, it helped to, to soften their hearts in order for them to come closer to God. Uh, so it was an individual form of spiritual practice. Uh, and it also did work for the village community. It was a kind of intercession it helped to, to heal people, and it, um, it was a form of prayer for the souls of the departed. So I spent a lot of time then examining the links between their explanations and philosophical traditions of Su Sufism, and really uncovered a very rich culture that these women practiced. Oh, sorry, I'm having tech issues now. <laughs> so... I, I stopped getting visas for China um, quite a long time ago. Uh, 2013 was the last time I was allowed into the country. Uh, I don't know exactly what the problem was, probably because I was researching Islam and already that was a problem at that time. So it's a long time since I've seen the women in that village. I haven't been able to contact them at all for the past three to four years uh, since phoning abroad 
became one of the signs of religious extremism and punishable by a term in the camps. I've not tried to contact them. But I still have very vivid memories of the women and that rich culture that they created. They were very powerful figures, you know, very consequential in, in the local community. Um, and they really made extraordinary efforts to create community in a very tough environment at that time. So all of this is to say that when today I read tweets put out by Chinese officials who claim that Uyghur women are nothing more than baby making machines until uh, liberated by the current policies, then I feel a particular fury, really. Um, so um, we've been hearing for some time now accounts of life in the camps, which are very disturbing. And many of them, um, even the early accounts really hinted at violence against women. And we've seen as time has gone on, these reports have become more and more explicit. Uh, and if you're, you're not up to speed with these reports, I would recommend a recent um, uh, report by the BBC, which has brought together accounts from various women. Listening to these, these accounts is quite difficult for me. It's difficult to think about the women I got to know in the village and their daughters who played with my daughters in the village and what might have happened to them, of course. So difficult, but not surprising. I would argue that the seeds of this abuse were, were sown a long time ago. For years, really for years, we academics have been writing about the position of ethnic minority women in China. We've written about the way that they are objectified, sexualized, pressed into the role of dancers, always smiling, always welcoming visitors to their exotic home whether that be visiting officials, foreign delegations or, or tourists. Um, and of course, you can see the same young women now perform, uh, performing the same role in, in the camps. So really this is the, the wider background to the position of Uyghur and other Turkic Muslim women in China. I think that no amount of singing and dancing or the narratives of terrorism should really distract us from these revelations of what I believe are systematic sexual violence in the camps. Uh, we know that since 2017, of course, over one and a half million people have been detained and subjected to a system in, in which, as Darren has said, they have no rights. Um, as Sairabul Sawat Bai, um, a former teacher in one of the camps said, the police had unlimited power. Detainees in the camps, we know, are systematically humiliated and dehumanized. I should put, point out, I think, that men, of course, male de detainees also experience violence in the camps. Again, we have many testimonies from men uh, talking about torture and even um, rape and sexual abuse. Uh, and of course, men are detained in larger numbers than women. So why then would I focus on women's experience? And I think there are particular aspects of this violence, this systematic violence against women, which are really relevant to the charge of genocide which um, as Sean has mentioned, are currently being discussed in, in many different places around the world uh, with, uh, in relation to the situation in Xinjiang. So the women in the camps we know, they range from the village women, um, like the women that I, I spent time with in 2009, um, but there are also highly regarded academics held in the camps. My own colleague, Rahila Dawut, is still in detention and her postgraduate students, some of them have also been detained. We know from uh, a recent testimony by Kelvin Osidik uh, about a special camp for students who studied abroad containing um, an estimated 10,000 young women um, held with shaved heads in crowded, unsanitary conditions, given unknown drugs, uh, and routinely abused. I would say that for each of the women uh, who 
make the decision to go public and um, talk about their experiences, there is a serious cost. Um, there is always a cost for those who dare to speak out. I, I really can't say how much I admire courage. They have to overcome traditional no notions of shame from within the community. And they're also targets for Chinese government agents who accuse them of lying, uh, who question their, their, their quality uh, or suggest that they are paid US agents. By now though, I think we have heard so many of these individual testimonies from women who either saw or directly experienced sexual violence. Uh, women who escaped from Xinjiang and are now based in different countries right around the world. Kazakhstan, Sweden, Holland, France, Turkey, the US. I think the time is long gone when we can dismiss these accounts and say that there's not enough evidence. Um, I, I think that not only is this, this abuse happening, but it's clearly very widespread across the camp system. And I think that we must assume, therefore, that it is really condoned at a very high level. So in many parts of the world, we've seen sexual violence against women used as a weapon of war. There are parallels um, with the experience of Bosnian women not so long ago in Europe, even more recently with the Yazidis and the Rohingya. In Xinjiang, we see, of course, this violence going hand in hand with other ways that Uyghur women are being targeted uh, with the wide reports of coerced marriage with Han Chinese men um, and clear evidence of enforced sterilization. All of this suggests a coordinated campaign, which in my view clearly, clearly falls within the accepted de definitions of genocide. So one last word um, about the possibilities for resistance and hope is a question that I'm often asked. Uh, and it is a difficult one to answer, of course. Uh, I think that right now within Xinjiang, the space for, for resistance is impossibly small. But I would say that um, faith, religion itself is a powerful tool for self-healing, for strengthening and, and a kind of resistance. So um, we can hear from some of these testimonies, for example, uh, the words of Gubahar Jalil, um, the, the, these stories of, of women within the camps um, whispering to each other, they can't stop you praying inside your head. And really in a situation where there is such intense surveillance and control over every action of, of the detainees and indeed of people with on, um, beyond the camps. You know, the, the space within one's head is still, is still perhaps a space that it is possible to, to retain a degree of self-control over. So that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Rachel for her talk. It reminds me, I've been teaching a course called Extreme Encounters with Power, how individuals experience politics for over 30 years now. Sadly, sexual violence in the camps could be a very apt candidate for inclusion. Next version of the syllabus. Okay, I think we're running a little bit late. Uh, so I'm gonna pass on giving the speakers a chance to talk to each other and comment on their own papers and have us go straight to questions. Uh, one of my colleagues at Berkeley, Frank Bialet, has uh, generously offered to accumulate questions and to give them to the, to the speakers. And uh, we'll do that for a bit. And then if we have time at the end, uh, we'll circle back to any final comments uh, by, by the speaker. So Frank, who's one of the leaders of our uh, Central Asian Working Group, uh, will take over from here. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And thank you for the, the four speakers. It was really, really amazing, amazing presentations. Uh, and I've learned so much. Um, I've, we have received quite a few questions, but first I wanted to see whether some of you had something to say about some of the presentations, if you had feedback or questions, and then we can move on and, and, and ask questions. Uh, do you? 
Well, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with a question for Sean that came um, just after your talk. Um, asking about the, the hand presence in China, because you've all spoken about uh, the Uyghurs, of course, who are the, the, the dominant group in Xinjiang and, and how many of them have been taken away to camps. But there's also been an influx of Han to the region. Uh, and because of the, the way the Uyghurs have been portrayed as dangerous and terrorists, uh, there was a question about, you know, how how do people feel about moving to Xinjiang, um, and and what if have you? I mean, that could be a question for other other speakers as well. What are the relations between the Han and the Uyghur on the ground? Yeah, I, I actually think uh, Darren might be. Um, he's been doing some research in terms of. Um, the attitudes of Han who are still in Xinjiang and how they how they feel about what's happening. Um, I mean, the one point I will make, I think I saw that question. It mentioned how um, Han end up in the region. I mean, one of the things that is happening is this. You know, some of the industrialization that Darren talks about in his research is bringing companies to the region, which which inevitably brings a certain part of the population um, from other, and, 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 and these companies are in fact linked through a, an interesting development uh, project that links different regions of China to different regions of the Uyghur area. And as a result, you have, you know, um, some people coming to the region that way through their companies investing in the Uyghur uh, region, um, and then, you know, like like the uh, the factory owner that Darren showed, perhaps. I could add something really quickly. Um, so, like Sean's saying, the, the the folks that are lined up with the state policies and that are working in security or working in these parrot assistance programs, um, they're still there, and 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 you know maybe finding some some um, some economic success. They might not necessarily appreciate all the aspects of living in Xinjiang because there's a lot of security um, and they might feel really compelled to participate in things that they don't uh, fully agree with. Um, others though that are not, you know, that were working in private, in the private sector prior to the campaign have left. Uh, significant numbers of people have left, especially from Southern Xinjiang. Um, so there's kind of been a shift in, in the economy at least for some people, towards securitization, towards this kind of forced labor regime. Um, people that are from the region that call themselves Lao Xinjiang or Bendi Ren, like uh, they have lived in Xinjiang for several generations. Many of them are still there. And, and, and my sense from interviews in 2018, when I was last there, is that many are quite upset with the situation because they think it's it's really a kind of dramatic overreach and that it will cause more problems down the line. Um, there is others though that you know embrace the system and, and think that this is China standing up for their rights and, and really taking care of the Xinjiang problem once and for all um, and really kind of embracing a sort of conqueror mentality. Um, so it's a range of different perspectives. Just to add something really briefly too, I would, I would also want us to remember that um, you know, the state has continued to incentivize teachers to come out in, in droves, especially as you know, the number of boarding schools and other state institutions has grown over the last few years. So we've seen pretty um, attractive compensation packages offered to people to come out you know, with an education background or maybe not even an education background to work in those schools. And the Bintuan, the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps has continued to again, offer very, very attractive compensation packages that include totally 100% subs subsidized housing, at least for you know, up to five years or six years and so forth. So beyond industry as well, there are other ways that that settler colonialism continues to play out. And there are other economic reasons that, that have continued drawing people out to the region. Thanks. Um, a question about uh, Uyghur music and dance. So that would be for Rachel, I think, because it, it kind of 
uh, response to one of the things you said, but also for Elise, I guess. Um, the So Rachel, you mentioned how the exoticization of women has, a, has kind of a long history in China. Uh, how does that uh, play with the suppression of culture? I mean, on the one hand, there is the sense that Uyghur culture is problematic because it's Islamic. At the same time, there is an exoticization of Uyghur dance and Uyghur music. So how, how is that fine line kind of treaded? Yes, so that, that, that's um, a nice one to tease out, isn't it? Um, so what, what we see, you know, I think it was one of, another of my colleagues, Ryan Thumb actually, um, coined this phrase, the hollowing out of Uyghur culture. And I think that's a really helpful idea. Um, so we, we get this kind of um, taking of um, Uyghur cultural items, like a tune, or um, some some kind of dance, and and then it being placed on stage, so that the 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 meanings really are are hollowed out, are, are, are taken away, and only the outside is then placed on stage for the gaze of the outsider, you know, for entertainment. And so there's a long history of that, of course, um, throughout the um, the the period of the People's Republic, and even going back um, beyond that, you know. Um, uh, I, I didn't speak about it actually in my talk, but um, I, I put up a little tweet from another uh, of my, my friendly Chinese officials who um, posted this this picture of a, a young woman, Uyghur woman in, in kind of belly dancing gear. And, and he was quoting from uh, a 1930s song by, by Wang Luo Bin, uh, which, um, you know, in, in sings in Chinese language, um, take off your veil, little sister, let, let me see your face, you know? So really the, this kind of objectification has, has a long history going even you know, beyond the, the, um, the, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. To add to it, so Rachel, which which song is that? Do you remember much about the source for that Wang Luobin song? Oh yeah, I could even sing it to you, Elise. But oh, you could sing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can sing it to me privately, baby. No, I just ask because. Um, sorry, I I will talk to everyone, not just to Rachel, but um, throughout. Right, if we continue teasing this out throughout Uyghur classical music. There are all sorts of metaphors about veiling. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, this could be another example of, right, kind of misunderstanding a metaphor as it exists in Uyghur music or deploying a metaphor as it exists in Uyghur music in another way, in another setting. Because classical music, for example, is full of talk about veils. And there will be lines that say, you know, remove the veil from your face. A lot of people interpret that as having to do with romantic love. It actually has nothing to do with romantic love. It has to do with the inseparability, or not the inseparability, the um, inability of humans to see the creator, to connect with Allah, right? So the relationship between Islam and music for Uyghurs, as for other people throughout the Islamic world, is far more complicated <laughs> than we often reduce it to being, right? And so when I saw that, that, that tweet, you know, take off your hijab, I immediately thought of, of lines like that and how th this could be another way of just hollowing something out, you know, misunderstanding it and using it in a different way. That's a really important and, and beautiful point to make. But of course, for the, I fear, for the majority of, um, you know, Chinese viewers, I mean, it, it's, 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 again, it's very reminiscent of, you um, colonial tropes of the Orient that we know very well in Europe and the US, isn't it? You know, when 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 I hear that, you know, take off your veil, I, I think of like dozens of, of classic kind of Hollywood movies and, and the, um, the belly dancer, you know, <laughs> direct, direct links. Yeah, that's true. Um, a question for Sean. Um, how do you account for the, the general silence coming from Muslim countries, except for maybe Turkey and Malaysia, about the issues of Xinjiang, what's, what's happening in Xinjiang right now? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people ask that question. Um, 
and I think it's more complicated than we often give it credit for. I think it's, I think it, it certainly is largely related to uh, the economic benefits that these states are um, getting from their relationship with the People's Republic of China. Um, but I think there's also, you know, talking to a lot of Muslims, they're, they're, they're very um, uh, open to the conspiracy theories that this is an American invention. Um, because one of the, way, the ways that people have been trying to deny what's happening is by referring to um, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And there's this, there's this kind of narrative going around, I think particularly in the developing world, trying to push um, the idea that, that this is, none of this is happening. This is, this is a conspiracy of the CIA. Um, and so, you know, I think that the, that's, that's another component. And then I'd say a, a third component is, I think much of the Muslim world doesn't really feel um, a close connection with the Central Asian Muslim world. It's, it's seen as, as, as somewhat removed. Um, but, you know, finally, the point about Turkey and Malaysia, which I think is important um, and is missing from, from all of that kind of interpretation is that um, what we know about in most Muslim majority countries is the attitude of the state. And there's a lot of states around the world that don't want to, um, th they don't want to deal with this problem because it, it has economic uh, ramifications for them in their trade with China. Um, and, you know, in, in more democratic political systems, people can push the state and, and they also have more access to information. So in places like Malaysia and Turkey, where there is, you know, a modicum of democratic, um, processes and there's a modicum of access to information, I think people are, it's become a more contentious issue. And I would add also Indonesia to that as well. I just add something really quickly, if I can. Um, the, I just, I saw a, a survey recently uh, that was done in Palestine or in Palestinian territories, surveying Palestinians and, and the responses from the folks surveyed, which is over a thousand people, so a really a, a pretty good study, um, was that over eighty percent of the people they interviewed were, you know, were standing in solidarity, wanting to stand in solidarity with the Uyghurs, and and really wanted, you know, more intervention on this issue. So I think what Sean is saying about you know kind of separating leadership from the general public is important for understanding how other Muslims view what's happening to the Uyghurs. Yeah, completely. Just to chip in on exactly the same point there, if, if, if we think about the kind of student activism that's gone in the UK, you know, I mean, it's very much led by, by Muslim student groups over here, which, which is very nice to see, you know. But also, you know, quite a lot of interest from Jewish student groups, I should say, which, which is also amazing, you know. Yes, and I... Uh... I will add, as someone who's regularly liaising with groups in Indonesia and Malaysia in particular, there is there is great civil society level or in grassroots level organizing happening in those countries and some really um, exciting, you know, projects with people who are, you know, want to support Uyghurs in spite of the silence or the complicity that they see from their own religious and political figures. Uh, two questions about the camps, uh, one for Darren, one for Rachel specifically, but I think, I think they, they'll probably be addressed to, uh, to both, of, I mean, to all of you really, I mean, you can, you can all respond to it. So the one for Darren is that one of your picture of the factory administration, it looked like some of them were Uyghurs. Is that the case? Also as camp directors and guards, we see many Uyghurs and Kazakhs. This complicates the picture we are often presented with in the press. Could you speak a bit to these complications? Is it pure coercion, do you think, or is it more complicated than that? So the role of Uyghurs and Kazakhs as guards. Uh, and for Rachel, when you say there, that there is a systematic sexual violence perpetrated in the camp, what do you mean by systematic? Could you explain what you mean by it and what not, please? Uh, do you mean that it is government organized? 
So I guess I could, I'll start and, and Rachel follow. Um, so yes, many, many of the guards are Uyghur or Kazakh. Um, in 2017 and 18, the state hired around 90,000 uh, new security workers. Um, many of them were from the Uyghur population, especially in Southern Xinjiang, uh, mostly young men, but also some women. Uh, they were hired as assistant police or in Chinese is called the xie jing, um, which means that they don't have the same sort of authority that real regular police have. They didn't carry weapons for the most part. Um, they had really 15 days of training before they were put on the job as security personnel. Uh, most of their work is in, is in uh, doing spot checks of people as they walk down the streets, manning checkpoints, working in the people's uh, convenience police stations with their, these surveillance hubs that are built throughout the region. Um, and then also working to in the camp system in transfers of detainees from uh, holding areas or uh, the sort of jails where people are first detained, the Kancho Soa, and then from there to the, the formal camps or to prisons um, and working inside the camps as well. Most of those folks are in lower level positions and they are also being surveilled by surveillance systems. Uh, the camps themselves have zero blank spots. That's how they're designed. That's how the government contracts lay out that they should be built. Um, and what I've heard from former detainees is, you know, sometimes it, it didn't seem to matter really who the guards were, if they were Uyghur or Han or, or not. Um, the dehumanization was an element in, 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 the, in any case. Um, it, so, you know, beatings of people as they walk down the street or, or walk down the hallways, um, calling them, you know, names like dogs and, and pigs, um, you know, animals that they don't deserve to be treated as humans. That, that was coming from Uyghur guards and from Han guards. Um, typically, though, in the higher level command, it was, it was uh, Han folks. Um, one of the things, elements in the system was that they would transfer uh, security workers from southern Xinjiang to northern Xinjiang, so they wouldn't have connections with the people they were they were patrolling. Um, but in general, the system is set up in such a way that it really doesn't matter that much who what the ethnicity of the person is, um, because if you don't perform as you're asked, you will be yourself subjected to detention, especially if you're Uyghur or Kazakh. Han Han guards, I guess that is one difference. If you're whether or not you perform as you're asked, you probably won't be subjected to detention in the camp unless you are very overt in how you're helping detainees. Um, you would probably be just disciplined in other ways. So that's how I would respond to that question that um, it's, it's the same in most cases, you know, policing in the US in prisons, you know, whether the, the guard is, you know, black or brown or white, like is going to do some of the, the difficult and, and you know, really dehumanizing work of, of treating people that are sort of judged as pre-criminal um, as a racial other, even though they are might, they might be of the same uh, ethnic or, or racial background. Yeah, and of course, in, in some of the, um, the women's testimonies that we've, we've seen, you know, these are women who were working as teachers or, or sometimes as, as, as cleaners or some kind of guard, you know, and they, they were actually, you know, observing these, these kind of regular patterns of violence against women and, you know, in some uh, accounts, um, taking the women to the, 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 the torture room, right, the black room, and then taking them out afterwards and taking them for a shower. You know, these are, these are Uyghur or Kazakh women. And again, it's that, that sense of, you know, if I don't do as I'm told, you know, it might, it might be me in there. So I, I mean, this is this is distressing, very distressing material. When I when I say systematic, you know, um, I mean specifically that um, the the number of accounts and the the regularity of of the violence that they describe is more than I think we can attribute to a few bad you know, people, a few bad men who, are, who have, have um, abused the system. I, I think it's clear that the numbers involved um, from the testimonies that we know go beyond that. So that's what I mean by systematic. I do not um, suggest that this has somehow been ordered at the top level, but I do believe that there must be some kind of tacit 
acknowledgement that, you know, this is fine, go ahead. Otherwise, it, I, I don't think that it could be going on at this kind of level. Um, you know, there are so many aspects of this, the, the, the accounts of, of, of bribes, you know, of men paying to get, get uh, to the, the pretty young women. You know, I, I don't want to get into too many details, you know, but there are many things which really suggest that this is endemic um, and that it is condoned at a high level. You know, I, I, I think, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of control over these, these camps, you know, and for something to be happening at this level, you know, it must be really known and, and condoned at a high level. Or Frank asked more uh, questions. I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, I wanted to thank the speakers. We have a hard stop at 12, so you may be interrupted uh, at, at the top of the hour, mid-word. I, I assure you, if you were here in person, we're not quite so brutish in the way we end things, but this is one thing that technology is doing for us. So I'd like to just have, uh, I'd like to thank you all for speaking and have Frank uh, pass on some more of the, the very interesting questions that are continuing to pour in. If I can just add to that last question, I mean, I think one of the one of the things that uh, we're only going to know uh, post facto is how many of um, these issues have been involved in this crisis. I mean, it reminds me a lot of other uh, crises of this kind, like in in the purges in the Soviet Union in the '30s, where you have also people likely turning each other in. You have people uh, under duress, you know, reporting others, and you know, it, it, it's it's easy to um, look at that and think, oh, these people are are traitors to their own people. But um, I think none of us can really put ourselves in that position and think what we would do. Um, and I think that you know, I I dread when we start learning about um, you know how pervasive the terror and um, pain of this has been. Thank you. We have a lot more questions, so we will only be able to address a few. I'm going to try and group two together. Uh, one is about the, the manufactured goods that are made in, uh, in, in Xinjiang, in these camps, and how they, they can end up in places like Europe and the US. Um, so what can we do? Is there any any mechanism that we could uh, get that is in place to kind of find out, track these goods and maybe boy boycott them? And the other question is really kind of the ethical um, uh, dimension of that in the, with regard to Chinese studies department in, in Europe and America, do you, if you're happy to share, do, have you found a certain level of censorship? Uh, in terms of what can what you can say about your work uh, coming from those departments, and and have you had issues also with visas uh, in terms of carrying your own work? So how do you how do you navigate that? Uh, continuing your work and and finding kind of uh, uh, roadblocks on the way. I can start uh, by talking about the labor a uh, bit. Um, and good. Quickly, so it, the supply chains are very complex. It's difficult to trace everything back to its, you know, to where the cotton was grown and picked, to where it was actually turned into thread and then manufactured and all of that. Um, what we do know, though, is that 84% of Chinese cotton comes from Xinjiang, um, and that in many cases there's forms of labor in forced labor in the actual picking of cotton, especially in southern Xinjiang, um, and then we do have some evidence of, of the ways that, that global brands are implicated in the production itself. Um, many global brands are beginning to relocate their supply chains to other places. That's already happening, um, kind of due to public pressure. Um, and there is some you know, bills before different government bodies in the US, there's a forced labor bill that's being considered and that would put actual you know, teeth sanctions and, and, and regulations around using products that are, are made through forced labor. It's a difficult thing to trace though. Um, and so it really just takes a lot of, of work on the part of you know researchers and others to, to really examine those things. I know Elise has been doing some of that as well. 
Right. Um, in the Q and A box, I just wanted to say really quickly: if you go to the answered questions, you can see where I dropped a couple of links for anyone who's interested in this forced labor question. I put a link to the the page for the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor, which is run by a steering committee that consists of a number of Uyghur organizations, including UHRP, where I work, but also major trade unions such as the AFL CIO and civil society organizations from around the world are working to put pressure on the brands right, to, to um, you know, move their supply chains away and so forth. So you can read more about that there. Uh, about the second question, do you wanna, okay. do you wanna address that? Sorry, Frank. I, I could just drop, drop a couple of um, comments about um, moves in, in the legislation in, in the UK at the moment. There are some very creative um, moves going on in, in parliament, uh, particularly from the House of Lords to um, link, um, UK trade to um, a court, uh, a UK court designation of genocide, uh, and the UK government is not surprisingly resisting furiously that one. <laughs> uh, and there, there are also some quite interesting um, moves going on to, to um, link trade to designations of modern slavery. So, so it, it's it's good to see people, you know, making these efforts. Although I'm I'm not terribly optimistic about it. And I mean, I can speak some to the second question. Um, uh, I've never felt any pressure from my institutions um, that I've worked at, um, luckily, um, in terms of kind of uh, not speaking about something or not writing about something. Um, I, I contributed to an edited volume back in, I think, 94, or no, I'm sorry, 2004, um, that led to a lot, of, uh, basically everybody who, who had a chapter in that edited volume, uh, which was a fairly innocuous um, volume about Xinjiang in general and um, different elements, um, was essentially kind of banned from the country. I haven't tried to get a visa since then um, because I didn't really want to try to you know, <laughs> go, go to a country that didn't really want me there because a lot of a lot of my colleagues who did try um, you know experienced all kinds of problems and um, as someone who is more kind of centered in Central Asia than in China I, I found no problem kind of just avoiding going to China but I know a lot of my colleagues had a lot more difficulty it really it really uh, interrupted some people's careers because they were um, supposed to be working on exchanges with China and they could no longer go there um, and so on. Um, and I think, you know, uh, uh, Rachel mentioned that she's recently uh, not been able to get a visa even before 2017. And just to chip in very quickly on that, <laughs> I'm mindful of the seconds going, but you know, I think it, there are big issues at the moment around Chinese students in, in, in Europe and in the US, you know, and I think it's really important that, you know, we are still very welcoming to, to Chinese students in, in these difficult times. I mean, I think there are, you know, serious issues that uh, departments have to consider in terms of direct contacts with perhaps departments um, within China or, or indeed on the kind of um, research that's going on in science, you know, and what kind of collaborations are, are going on. But I just would like to say that we, we should be really, you know, extending a very warm welcome to Chinese students just to keep that dialogue going. So I'm going to thank you again for these fascinating uh, presentations. Um, and yes, and sorry for all the other questions we could not get to. Thank you. <laughs>